All right, welcome everyone. We'll get started. Good evening and welcome to the Center for Studies in Religion and Society's first uh, in-person lecture of the winter 2023 term. My name is Kathy Chan and I am the acting director of the CSRS for the 2022-23 academic year. I'd like to open tonight's lecture by acknowledging and respecting the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria sits and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Saanich peoples who have continuing historical relationships with this land. And I'm very pleased tonight to introduce uh, tonight's lecturer, Dr. Francis Landy. Francis is a valued member of our community of associate fellows with a BA attained, attained from Cambridge University in 1969 and a PhD that he obtained from the University of Sussex in 1983. For over 30 years, uh, Francis taught in the religious studies program at the University of Alberta, specializing in Jewish studies and the Hebrew Bible. You can always be counted on to add rich and interesting insights in our discussions at the CSRS. And I look forward to hearing his thoughts on the three basis, basic concepts of deity in the Hebrew Bible. Thanks for being with okay. us, Francis. Okay. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, you can all hear me and out in Zoom land, I hope. Let's put my glasses on. So a small note to begin with. Uh, in uh, Hebrew, uh, the name of God is, as you see here, Y-H-W-H. Um, Hebrew only has consonants in its alphabet or semi-consonants. Uh, scholars um, universally agree that uh, it, the name was pronounced with the vowels that you see there, A and either E or I, we don't quite know, uh, largely based on uh, Greek transcriptions. Uh, um, as a Jew, I cannot pronounce the name of God which is very awkward. I might even slip for the first time ever. But so I will tend to say YHWH, which is very cumbersome and forgive me. Okay, so let's work out how to go. And here's a little picture, uh, you know, to, just to keep you entertained. Uh, this is from the, from the Kuntilet al Ajrud in inscriptions. Uh, no, um, uh, in in southern uh, in Sinai, southern negative. Uh, I, I might have got this wrong, but I think that the the bull-faced and the very ethyphallic uh, figure is uh, Y H W H. Uh, there's a, a figure of uh, of uh, the Egyptian god Best behind him, and then there's a, the uh, a uh, a female figure probably with a liar just behind. So anyway, that's it. So it shows you that people did draw a uh, who Okay, uh, every year I teach a couple of classes for, uh, for Professor Christopher Douglas. Over there. A, a very enjoyable experience for which I'm profoundly grateful. But the first time I did it, a very bright student, uh, Kareen Hack, whom many of you might remember, uh, wanted to know what I thought about the concept of God in the Hebrew Bible. I asked her if she and the other students uh, knew, had studied Buddhism. Uh, they had. I thought it was analogous to the concept, at least that's what I said, of the three bodies of the Buddha. The historical Buddha, the Samboga Buddha, the Buddha who is more or less uh, incarnated in the Buddhist community and teaching, and the Buddha of the ultimate reality of enlightenment, the Dharma Buddha. YHWH, on one level, was a character like other gods who acted in history, whose story the Bible told, 
to whom people prayed. On, a, on another level, uh, YHWH was the patron god of Israel. The projection of its hopes, its identity, its ideals. On a third fundamental level, YHWH was the ultimate reality from whom the universe came forth and to which it returned. The horizon of life and death within which we all live. Similarly, with other ancient gods, I thought that YHWH was essentially multi-leveled, like all of us. I'm not sure it was a very good answer, but I liked it. And it changed my life. It's amazing what a class can do. Another trigger was a few months ago. Chris Douglas mentioned in a class I teach weekly that he was reading a book by Francesca Stavrakopoulou called God and Anatomy, which he, find, which he found really exciting and mind-changing. He's not the only one. Francesca won the English Penn Prize, Hessel Titman Prize, for the best nonfiction book of 2022. And I like her as a friend. And I liked her previous book called The Land of Our Fathers on Ancestor Worship in Ancient Israel. She argues over 500 pages that God in the Hebrew Bible is a material corporeal being, a supersized human, and that all the anthropomorphic imagery is to be taken literally. God has hands, a face, a penis, etc. She's not the first to argue this. Howard Alberg Schwartz did it nearly 50 years ago, 30 years ago, sorry. She writes very well, as Chris knows, and has fascinating comparative material. But I think she is fundamentally wrong. That's why I'm here. I've had several, let's go down a bit. This is, so these are my sources. Uh, I've had several companions on this voyage. As you can imagine, there's a huge literature. One is Michael Hundley, uh, YHWH, he actually spells it out, uh, Among the Gods, The Divine in Genesis, Exodus, and the Ancient Near East, published by Cambridge in 2022. Hundley opened my eyes to the complexity of ancient thinking about the gods and how it is related to, th to the thinking about YHWH. Secondly, there is Theodore Lewis's magisterial, a thousand page, The Origin and Character of God, published by Oxford in 2020. Every page of which I've read. And thirdly, there is a lovely book by Cornelius Den Hertog, The Other Face of God, I Am That I Am Reconsidered, Sheffield Phoenix, 2012, uh, which is a tremendously accessible, if it isn't a contradiction in terms, Lacanian study of the image of God in Exodus, and gave me my idea that God is ultimately the, the real, a limit term beyond all our constructions, though that simplifies Den Hertog enormously. There are some assumptions to begin with. First, I assume that all thinking is metaphorical. I take this from the foundational work of the modern cognitive study of metaphor. George Lakoff and Mark Johnson's Metaphors We Live By, first published in 1980, that one thinks on the basis of primary bodily experiences, such as up and down, and relations of analogy and difference. Sabrakapulu argues against the idea that the physical images of God 
for God, like God's hands and face, are mere metaphors to be seen through, as one of her lecturers put it. And she is quite, and she's quite right. But I think it is just the opposite, that all we have is metaphors, that only thus can we translate the unknown into the known. Hands and faces are the repositories of enormous clusters of, so of associations, all of which are in play whenever we speak. Think about what hands mean. Secondly, ancient people inhabited a world full of invisible as well as visible beings, constantly engaged with and affecting us for good or ill, and whom we could, one could influence, for example, through magic, and with whom one could negotiate. Savrakapulu is quite right that the boundaries, our boundaries between our world and the other world were porous. It is one of the best parts of her book. Cognitive scientists have an acronym for this. HADD, H-A-D-D. Hyper, hyperactive agency detection device. I always want to say detection agency, detective agency. Uh, the tendency of people to ascribe agency to inanimate objects and processes. Anyone who's ever kicked a television knows this. Everywhere, everything is alive. That was the fundamental assumption right until the modern era. Many people still believe that. The, the corollary of this is that everything was independent, interdependent, not physically, but as it were, psychically. There is much evidence for this throughout the Hebrew Bible. For example, the earth is responsive to human failings vomiting out its inhabitants. The heavens give and withhold rain on ethical grounds. Thirdly, consciousness was the basis of reality. This is very strange to us in our vast and impersonal universe. But for them, mind was part of the world and its substrate. Materialism, though it had its ancient forerunners, is extremely recent. Classical Buddhism still holds that there is no division between mind and world. And apparently, this is a major difference between Asian cognitive scientists who see mind and world as being on a continuum and Occidental ones. Neoplatonists held that God thought the world into being. The Hebrew Bible begins with creation as God's language. At the edge of consciousness, there is, of course, death, ultimate death and extinction. Gods are born in the human mind. Ancient people lived in a world full of terrifying, incomprehensible, as well as vital forces, both within the human person and outside it. These forces manifested themselves to humans as deities, to whom humans ascribe names, personalities, and histories. I never realized until I read Michael Hunley's book how complex and, and polythetic polytheistic systems were, or how varied. I had an intimation, though, a few years ago when Corinne Bonnet, head of the Institute for the study of Mediterranean polytheisms, and polytheisms in Toulouse, said after a paper of mine that in Phoenicia, the goddess Ashtarte was the face of the male god Baal. That Baal has a female face blew my mind. Gods were aspects of each other in giant constellations. You have incredible combinations like Amon-Re, Harakhti Atum in Egypt, and uh, 
Y-H-W-H, Elohim, or El Shaddai in the Hebrew Bible. The same divinity could manifest himself or herself in different localities, like medieval saints. Gods generally appeared in human form. The philosopher Paul Ricoeur thought that YHWH is a person that, you know, that, that thought that Yahweh was a person is the foundational root metaphor in the Hebrew Bible, which begs the question. Michael Humley argues that anthropomorphism was a device whereby gods could relate to human beings. Just as the rabbis thought that God accommodated himself in human language. But deities could also take other forms, notably in Egypt, but also in Israel. YHWH sometimes appears as a lion, Ariel, as fire, as wind spirit, as a bear, as a bull, Likewise, gods have different roles. Re or Ra is sim in Egypt is simultaneously a person, king of the gods, the sun, and justice. I do not know if Hunley is right. Perhaps the human form divine, as Blake puts it, is intrinsic to divinity, as it appears to or is projected by us. But what is important is that, contra Stavrakapulu, it is form, not body. YHWH insists throughout the Hebrew Bible that the difference between him and humans and other animals is that he is not flesh, mortal and corruptible. Stavrakapulu talks of light and sound as being material but I do not know what she means. Perhaps it is form in the platonic sense. On one level it is, but I want to go somewhere else. I think I've missed this. Okay. Um, YHWH is a desert god. His origins are very obscure. He seems to emerge from a host of minor deities. So it says in Deuteronomy 33, 2, and to be identified with or even displace the older Canaanite supreme deity, El, which simply means God. In all the most ancient biblical poems, YHWH, comes from the south or southeast, beyond Israel's historical borders, in the territory of Israel's arch fraternal enemy, Edom. So YHWH is extraterritorial, alien to the land which he calls his own, just as Israel in their national story are always outsiders, alien to the land, um, no, alien, not quite at home in the land they have conquered. In particular, in the foundational narrative of the Exodus, YHWH reveals himself to Moses and subsequently to Israel in the in-between space, neither Egypt nor Canaan. This means that he cannot be identified like other gods with any one political entity. His fortunes are not tied to the state. There is an unease at the foundations, which also enables YHWH to become a universal God. The desert is outside human culture. The agricultural rhythms on which ancient civilizations depended for the Deuteronomist, the name of the mountain of God is Horeb, the, the dry place where nothing grows. 
It is also far from Mount Olympus and its ancient Near Eastern counterpart, Mount Sapun, et cetera, the mountain of the gods. YHWH was always a loner. In the desert, where everything is stripped away, one goes to meet oneself or one's destiny. In a famous story, in 1 Kings 19, we have the story here, uh, the prophet Elijah flees from the evil queen Jezebel to a cave in the mountain, in the mountain of God, goes right back to the beginning. And here's YHWH, the one who calls him, not in wind or fire or earthquake, but in the sound of still silence. Silence speaks. But supposing it doesn't. Jacques Derrida, in his fragmentary thoughts about religion, writes about the desert within the desert. The possibility that in the desert one will hear nothing. That there is nothing. Just desert. I'll turn to my next text. This is text two. Moses does hear in his flight from Egypt, from his privileged childhood to a simple shepherd's life in one of those odd quirky dialogues that open up the deepest possibilities of meaning. He asks, what is your name? What is what his name? Perhaps to gain time. He might expect an ordinary divine name like Ray or Mardo or Shamash, the sun god or goddess. Instead, he hears, I am that I am, or in Hebrew, I will be what I will be, which might be evading the question. Perhaps like the Egyptian creator god Amun, his true name is totally hidden as in Jewish history. But then he elaborates, say to them, I am sent me to you. This is as bizarre in Hebrew as it is in English. And then God, flickering in the fire of the burning bush, repeats, thus shall you say to the children of Israel, YHWH, the God of your ancestors sent me to you. This is my name forever my remembrance for, for generation after generation. YHWH is some kind of anomalous form of the verb uh, HWH, um, to be. So it is he is, or he will be, he causes, etc. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, translated it as tohon, being in platonic fashion. Unlike other deities, YHWH is the ground of being, to use Paul, Tillich, Paul Tillich's portentous phrase. But we should note that it is a verb, a process. In Hebrew, perfect, imperfect, present and future tenses merge into each other. If you like, God is ever becoming. A rather popular Kabbalistic book published some time back is called God is a Verb by David Cooper. We have to stop thinking of God as a noun, a being. God, one evidence for this is a phonetic metaphor. Y-H-W-H, at least in Hebrew, is all vowels, the ever-shifting sound of the universe. Okay. Nevertheless, ancient Hebrews obviously related to God as a person, as father, 
king, judge, teacher, all familiar authority figures. Most of all as Adonai, Lord, before whom we are servants. God is utterly remote, transcendent, beyond the highest heavens, and also absolutely intimate. Knowing the secrets of the heart, living in the fissures, the broken heart. God is the other, the absolutely other, who loves us, cares for us, judges us, and condemns us. Sometimes this is felt as persecutory, for example, by Job. The relationship with God becomes the prototype of every relationship, notably with ourselves, as expressed poignantly in the image of the covenant. But at this point, we have questions. What is a person? A father, a king. A father whose re relationship to us is not overtly biological. A king who, after the destruction of the two kingdoms of Israel and Judah, has no kingdom. And even before then, what will be the relation of the human king to the divine one? The tale told in the Book of Kings is a sorry one. The more grandiose the divinity's claims, the less, the less substance they have. Hence the questions of theodicy asked throughout the Bible, shall the judge of all the earth not work justice? Every year, the ancient Israelites would go to see the face of God in the great pilgrimage festivals, especially the autumn festival of tabernacles. Savra Kapulu takes this literally, quote, worshippers hope for the privilege of pilgrimage to a temple, to see a statue of the deity in all its glory, to lock eyes with the deity, to see and be seen in the most profound and physical of ways, end of quote. But there is no evidence that there was such a statue. And even if there was, that the worshippers thought that they were looking at the actual face of the deity. But what is a face? Especially the face of a statue, but a representation, an artist's imagination of what cannot be seen, the expressions, the feelings, and interior life. Face in Hebrew has many meanings, in particular presence, just as it does in English. The word is actually plural, faces, facets. To see the face of God is to feel his presence, which must be combined with many other things like community, the sensory appeal of ritual. But the text says specific, specifically to be seen. What we see is that we are seen in an exchange of vision. It is indeed profound, but physical. In Psalm 36, 10, it says, in your light, we see light. The lights commingle, the light we see, and the divine light by which we see. There can be no clearer statement in the Hebrew Bible of the union of self and God their interfusion without interruption. YHWH is a person, as I've mentioned, whose adventures and relations with humanity constitute our Bible. As a person, notoriously, he is subject to mood swings, devastating anger, as well as unconditional love which never turns out to be unconditional enough. The divine person is all too human and certainly not a goody two shoes, despite all his claims not to be a man. As Katie Heffelfinger shows in her book on second Isaiah, the divine character is fundamentally unstable. 
imp improvisatory, which makes it interesting. A person, my first body of God, is an amalgam, a symbol for everything that happens in our lives, of the complex interaction of our neurological and hormonal makeup, the different parts of the brain, our life experiences, the world we, we grow up in. The neuroscientist Douglas Hofstadter, whose book, I'm a Strange Loop, I refer to again and again, talks of the feedback loops between what he calls symbols, spools, spools of simulations, and symbols, the primary, most intimately own one being the self, the I. I am is a work in progress. As a person, YHWH has two functions. One is to pose questions to the many vivid characters of the Bible. I think I've got it. To open up the ground under their feet, as it were. Where are you? He says to Adam. Where is Abel, your brother? He says to Cain. He is an inner voice in their own self-revelation. In his extraordinary enigmatic dialogue with Moses, I was actually going to quote this originally, but I didn't. He enables Moses to see as far as possible into the depths of YHWH's own personality. Let me know your ways that I might know you. But it is also Moses looking into himself, seeing himself as God knows him. You have known me by name, he says. And at the same time to see that the core of the self is infinitely regressive. That all that can be seen is the back, a very strange metaphor, as YHWH passes, just as we cannot catch the moment, that as soon as it arrives, it is gone in the flow of existence. The second function is more, is more cosmic. YHWH is a, a um, projection. Vastly magnified of all the conflicts and dilemmas of, existence, of human existence. If a primary statement in the Hebrew Bible is that humans are in the image and likeness of God, incidentally, I think that uh, Stavra Kapulu is quite wrong to say that this is obviously purely physical, since the word for likeness, demut, refers to the imagination and metaphor. The corollary is that God is the archetype for everything human. In particular, there is the problem of human violence in a world which was terrible indeed. If YHWH is the power behind the Assyrian and Babylonian armies and not Ashur and Marduk, it is he, not they, who destroys his people, his temple, and in a way himself. In Isaiah 45, seven, famously, it says that God makes peace and creates evil. The great temptation throughout the Bible, beginning with the flood story, is for God to abandon his experiment, to destroy the world because, I'm going to go back, because of its violence. Is something better than nothing? Is life preferable to death? Many characters, Job, Elijah, Jonah, say so, say no. I don't want to suggest that for the writers, a YHWH was not real. He was terrifyingly so. But we cannot ignore that YHWH was also a creation of the writers, a rhetorical stratagem, if you will. It is the Joe poet 
who imagines God's speeches from the whirlwind. If you want to tell a good story, especially if it is your story, you have to have characters because humans and deities act in time. Writers stage ideas, disputations, the manifold intertwinings of feelings and thoughts. In the drama, YHWH is a character, but always something a bit more than a character, one of the players. As a person, YHWH represents the super person, that part of us perhaps which is hyper real, that touches and transforms us at odd moments. YHWH appears and disappears. The possibility that takes us out of the ordinary contingent world into an alternative, more fundamental reality. What David Schulman calls writing about Indian drama more than real. Hence the element of the fantastic about all biblical narratives of which Laura Felt writes so movingly. The second level or body is uh, YHWH as the national God of Israel. Hence the repository of all its hopes and, uh, and ideals. YHWH chooses Israel to be his flag bearer in the world. There is nothing unique about this. There has hardly been a people in history who have not had a sense, an ideology of manifest destiny. American exceptionalism is not exceptional. The deity was the focus of national identity. For example, in pilgrimage festivals, centralization and the exclusion of the worship of other gods was a rather self-conscious stage in this process. But YHWH also represented how Israel liked to see itself. The Torah is YHWH's embodied and enacted word, insofar as it was ever practiced. YHWH is the exemplar of justice, love of strangers, loyalty, kindness, and compassion Israel would like to emulate. You shall be holy as I, YWH, your God, am holy, is how the holiness code begins its vision of an ideal society based on love of one's neighbor in Leviticus 19.2. Its holiness sets Israel apart from other nations, just as it aspires to be a model for them. The wager is that there is a story leading from creation to final redemption, one version of which is religious Zionism. Despite everything, good will triumph. All peoples will come to Zion and learn the ways of peace. The opposite is that there is no story, no comfortable ending, that history is a mere sequence of random events, the rise and fall of empires. The two narratives, of Genesis Kings and Chronicles seem to end like that, with a whimper rather than a bang. Then there are two trajectories. One is that chosenness is transferred, e.g. to the Persian Empire, and the mission of Israel is redefined as a light to the nations. Judaism becomes a diaspora religion. God, as it were, chooses exile. The other is that there will be a glorious transformation, a peripatia. The two visions compete and intertwine throughout the histories of Judaism and Christianity. The third level, which I have left to last, is the real. The real Cornelius Den Hertog says, is a limit concept on the border of what cannot be expressed. It may be traumatic, as when God speaks to Moses out of the trauma of slavery. It may be death, 
which is unassim unassimilable to human experience, which cannot be personified or deified. It may be erotic. YHWH's passionate desire for Israel and his being a jealous God whose very name is Jealous. We are on the borders of sexual trauma. The imperative to unite and be separate, which is one of the fundamental problems of the Bible. Jacques Lacan says of the real that it is the mystery of the unconscious, which he glosses as the mystery of the speaking body. The unconscious, which for Lacan is beyond the horizon of what can be known and spoken, but which gives rise to our sense of self and our symbolic and imaginary lives. The writers, I assume, were in touch with the unconscious, that hidden, even chemical and neurological substrate from which thoughts, images, and metaphors arise. The unconscious, both national and personal. YHWH, wind, spirit, fire, is the air we breathe that which consumes us and gives us, warms us and gives us life. There is, however, loss, a great gap. We don't know the processes precisely by which YHWH came to be the only God to be worshiped. And finally, the sole God in the universe. This is my last page. I seem to have lost a page. Oh, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Hebrew Bible tells its story from the point of view of the victors. The destruction of local cults and centers, the abolition of the worship of subordinate deities meant a radical simplification of the rich polytheistic universe. Universally in the ancient world, the male supreme god was accompanied by his female consort, the goddess. Throughout the history of Israel, we find images of the goddess at least female fig figurines and traces of her worship as the queen of heaven for whom women wore ta wove tapestries in the temple court and baked cakes. Asherah, the goddess, is the object of profound loathing by the biblical writers. This accompanies other processes, the exclusion of women from priestly service, the male god with his male acolytes, misogyny and sadism. There is a very dark side to biblical religion. As the incest texts of Leviticus show, non-normative sexuality is terrifying. What takes the place of the goddess? In Deuteronomy, the part written after the exile, there is a partial transference of the male imagery of God to female imagery. God is the mother who gives birth to the new age and the new Zion who likewise is both spouse and mother. For the only time in the Hebrew Bible, God is addressed explicit, explicitly as she, curiously in the guise of the warrior goddess. Elsewhere, wisdom is the daughter of God. YHWH, person, God of Israel, the reality behind all events, the flow of being, all-encompassing, whose glory fills the entire earth, insatiable and ambivalent, with its desire for the Asherah, for us, with all the conflicts of the patriarchy he authorizes. Perhaps we can touch on a YHWH beyond YHWH. Listen in the desert to something. Thank you, Francis, for that uh, 
on a lecture and uh, exploration and explication of these three concepts of God. I think it was the kind of lecture we can all say that you can only give after a lifetime, right, of engaging with these texts. So thank you for that. It's a great gift. Um, we have about uh, 15 minutes, just about, and um, I've got some questions, but we have a room full of people who know more than I do. So do we have uh, someone who wants to start us off? Yes? Yeah, go ahead. There's a microphone coming. If you could speak in it just because they can hear you then on Zoom. If it's a yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you for all of your wonderful words. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, my big struggle has always been with um, humanizing the image of God mm. rather than expanding our understanding of who we are mm. in the likeness of God that we that if we if we in our thinking limit you know uh, create the image of god from our from our human image uh, rather than allowing for the reality of that which is unknown to actually be us making us more than what we allow ourselves mm -hmm. to be as human beings that we've done this, I just see it all the time where there's this kind of talking about faith and religion and belief and mystery. And then we do this, you know, thing where we retract. I don't know if it's out of fear or what. And we all of a sudden in the middle of it, um, make this switch into um, humanizing uh, the identity of God by the way that we interpret it rather than, I mean, now we have the idea that we have three kinds of DNA, mm -hmm. which to me helps us understand more about the possibilities of what we are as a human being. And um, so there, that's, that's my thing, is how can we prevent ourselves, not just by not saying the word God, but by not limiting um, ourselves, the possibility for ourselves as being in the image of God. Am I making any sense? Uh, yes, of course. Um, but I am not sure that I can really give an adequate response. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, you capture rather well what I was trying to say. Uh, and um, I think on the one hand, yes, um, it may be true, as Michael Hanley says, that uh, the anthropomorphic imagery is, is ways, are ways for gods, the gods, to, 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 to limit themselves in order to communicate with human beings. Um, on the other hand, uh, whatever the divine stands for in us, it's a way of us opening ourselves to uh, to, to alternative realities. I would say, by the way, not just human, I would say also animal. I'd, I'd say it's more than human. Thank, thank you. Um, I, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Chris. Oh, thank you. One of them would be um, 
my impression from reading Stavra Coppola is that she thinks that, um, you know, at a sort of early stage of Israelite religion, uh, God was conceptualized as having a body, but eventually, um, you know, as to, especially when we get by biblical writers, it turned to metaphor after a certain time period. So I guess my question would be, do you think that, do you think that's right? Do you think that at an early stage in Israelite religion, God was, uh, YHWH was considered to have a body like the other gods? So I, I guess partly I'm wondering if we, if other gods have bodies, why wouldn't YHWH also have, have a body or, is, you know, you sort of started the talk by situating, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, your, your talk with, with um, Hundley and Lewis and so forth. And as far as my understanding goes, some of the early conceptions about other gods were that they did have bodies. So at what stage does YHWH become sort of an exceptional god and not having a body uh, in the ancient Near East? Um. Well, first of all, uh, uh, I would say, that at least from my reading, which isn't complete, of uh, Francesca's book, Tabra Kapulu's book, uh, she, she actually sees uh, God becoming more anthropomorphic as time goes on. You know, she ends up with, with Daniel and uh, the old man with a, with a, with a beard. Uh, and then she, she carries on. I mean, she, she's very good at going on to, to the history of these images throughout in Christianity, especially. Uh, so I, I don't see the evolutionary scheme in her book, but uh, I might be wrong. Uh, as to the, your second point, uh, I, I, I would say that um, uh, not only God's but, but, all, but many, 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 many beings, um, ghosts, um, ghosts, ancestors, all sorts of, of uh, don't have bodies. You know, there's, uh, they can assume bodies. Uh, they can appear in the form of bodies. They can be even praised in those forms, but those are just appearances. Uh, I think there's a fundamental difference, um, also continuity, but, but basically, basically a difference between corporeal beings and incorporeal beings. You know, we have this, even now, you know, lots and lots of people believe in ghosts. Um, ghosts are rather different from us because they, they don't have, uh, they don't have bodies in our sense, they might have sort of, a fluffy ether. We have a question from the Zoom audience. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Rick Van Manen. Oh, hello, Rick. <laughs> he says, uh, is YHWH always tied to the desert? And is it only by entering into the desert that we encounter YHWH? Is this connection to the desert, quote, exceptional? Uh... Hmm. Well, in answer to, to the question, obviously, no. Uh, YHWH is encountered in the temple and in many other ways, you know, people always meeting. Nonetheless, there is always a sense of strangeness. So this Projection outside historical Israel, I think, is symbolically very important. Uh, now, suddenly, I've forgotten the second part of the question. Um, oh, um, there are other desert gods. Uh, for example, in 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 Ugarit, uh, Amuru, and in. Kadishu are the desert gods. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, by the way, there's also, and I haven't really thought about it, there's the, there's the Azazel, the um, goat god, who is the spirit of the demonic spirit of the wilderness. It's, it, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a world populated by, by very, very weird things. 
features. We have another Zoom question from Brett Kane. Yes, Professor Landry, I've heard it said that a further amplification of the name YHWH slash I am that I am is, quote, you shall come to know me as you walk with me, unquote. Could you comment on this? I'm, I'm not sure where, where that comes from, what your source is. Uh, I would say it's probably thinking in terms of, and this is very traditional, that I will appear in whatever form I will appear in, depending on circumstances. I will not be fixed in any one particular image. Uh, that's probably what, what your source is thinking, thinking of, but I, I would need to, to know more. Hi, I was wondering if there are any moves recently in Judeo-Christianity towards a female God or the idea of um, God having a female consort? Uh, not only recent, but, but extremely ancient. Uh, you, you can't su suppress the female, the female side forever. Um, so in, in, in Christianity, especially in Orthodox and uh, Catholic Christianity, you have the Virgin Mary, who's, who's, a, god, who's a goddess in all but name. In uh, Judaism, you have the Shekhinah in Kabbalah, which dates back maybe to, uh, certainly to the 11th century, if not earlier. Uh, so yes, and of course, with the development of uh, feminist movements, both in Judaism and Christ Christianity, you have a, a, a cultivation of the feminine aspect of God, you know, a, a very self-conscious cult cultivation. But, uh, and I would say it's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We'll wait till tomorrow. We'll pick okay. it up again tomorrow. Okay. I think I'd probably better wrap it up for tonight. Um, so thank you again. You know, you started in such a nice um, note for all of us who, who teach about uh, this project, starting off with your uh, conversation um, with your with your student and it's, it's ended in a similarly nice way. So if everyone could join me and uh, thank Francis Landy for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Um, next week, just um, the, our lecture, ooh, yeah. our lecture for next week, I, I'm walking away hoping that'll help, but I'm going to be outside soon. Um, our lecture for next week has been rescheduled. Um, so our, our next lecture is on Thursday, uh, February the 9th. We have a special visitor coming from uh, the UBC Faculty of Law, uh, Dr. Brian Bird, um, who works at UBC, uh, is, uh, knows, uh, writes a lot about religious freedom and freedom of religion and conscience. He's one of the people who's written the most in Canada on freedom of conscience in particular. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, conscience and democracy. So uh, hopefully many of you can join us for that. Um, and once again, thank you to Dr. Landy for being with us. Thank you.